Now, the motivation behind building, especially a personal branded business, is usually about providing value and building relationships and um, also monetizing our IP beyond our one and only role. But with that said, usually the financial health of running a business, especially when it comes to having a personal branded business, usually it takes a backseat because it's quite confusing, it's overwhelming. And for those who are leaving corporate, it's not necessarily one-on-one -on -one to say, I just need to replace my salary and that's it. And since there's so much confusing information around what's right and what's wrong when it comes to st starting, growing, and then of course also scaling your personal branded business, we are joined by somebody who is supporting business owners in their journey of building a sustainable business. Carla Titus is this week's guest and I'm so excited about this conversation to teach us more about the financial side of running a business. Carla, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to share all the knowledge uh, with all of your <laughs> audience today. And and same because, you know, to be honest, this is the first time in nearly 150 episodes that we're talking about the financial side of running, especially a personal branded business. And when we talk about personal branded business, it basically means the business is centered around your expertise, your education, your experience, and you as the person is um, the leading factor of the business. But with that said, there is so much confusing uh, information and conflicting information also out there when it comes to what it actually takes to start, grow and scale your business. Could you give us the lay of the land when it comes to what are the financial terms and aspects that we need to consider when we are um, interested in setting up our own business? Yeah, it, just being clear on what are your goals around what do you need to bring home? And, you know, working towards that is going to serve you really well in the beginning. So make sure that you sit down and have a plan, have some numbers in mind, even if they might not feel real yet, just having a plan and setting that direction for your business is going to be a key starting point. Obviously doing your books every month, is going to help you understand how you are progressing towards those goals and knowing that you're actually making the money that you intended to make. And if you don't, that's okay, that you can course correct along the way and pivot as necessary to make sure you're bringing in the type of revenue that you expect as you're growing your company. And also understand what are your costs in doing business, knowing what is left after all of that. And then don't forget, please, to set some money aside for taxes, because that should never be a surprise in business. But for business owners that may be just getting started or just starting to become profitable, this could be a new thing for you to have to deal with. And if you haven't properly budgeted, you could get surprised with a huge tax bill if you're not doing this correctly. So just being proactive and managing some of those costs, making sure that as you're you know, deciding whether or not to bring on team, that you're not bringing in a full-time person right off the bat. If you don't have the work for them, then maybe you start smaller and scale over time to that size team down the road. It's going to be part of the importance of planning financially in your business as you're getting started and making sure that you know what's happening by looking at your numbers every month, your profit and loss statement. You only have to look at four numbers, revenue, cost, expenses, and net profit. And then you know, am I making money or not? That should be the first question you're answering every single month. And if you're not making money, what is your path to get back to making money again? Oh, I love that shortcut because it's so true. You need to know your numbers. And at the same time, it's also a bit daunting. It could also be a little bit frustrating, especially at the beginning, because yes, we can set the goals of a gazillion dollars of income, but then at the same time, reality often hits differently. How do we even set a budget? What should we aim for a revenue goal just to start off with? Yeah. So when you're just starting, you can be pretty conservative. You can just say, I'm going to get two clients at whatever price point you have set for your services. If you're getting a lot of yeses when pitching to people for the sale and they're really fast, you might want to consider revisiting your pricing. I find that most times what happens is um, when entrepreneurs um, are new to the space, but they have years of corporate background experience behind their belt and they just think oh well I'm new to the space so I'm going to charge like a new person you are discounting all your expertise and knowledge that you bring to the table yes you might not know exactly how to support small businesses yet but you do have a lot of knowledge and expertise so make sure that you're not underpricing yourself will be the first thing and then two it's all a trial and error sometimes you just have to try your pricing before you realize oh my goodness this is too easy that means maybe i'm not charging enough let me push it a little farther and see if i'm still getting yeses and if i'm not that's okay then that tells me that the market is not bearing the you know not seeing the value maybe it's a communication issue maybe you need to 
you know, redo your value proposition for what you're doing for services attached to that price point. Because at the end of the day, it's all in the perspective of the buyer. Do they see the value in what you're pitching them for the price point that you have quoted them? And this is such an important um, information to consider that just because you don't have um, the experience working with businesses, for example, you still have the experience working in corporate. And it's more so translating it into a different setup or scenario. And it's it's not going to be lost the expertise. So discounting certainly doesn't work in your favor. I remember one of my very first clients who I did social media content for, I didn't know what to price. And I did the entire stretch here, create content, the visuals, everything, and charged $230 or something. And it took me like 40 hours. <laughs> I was like, okay, so this is not sustainable, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you did the math and you're like, well, hourly that I was making more just being on my job. Why would I do this for that? But you learn, right? And so the goal is like, we get that information, we get the data points, we do the analysis and decide, wow, that hourly rate really doesn't work for me. So it's either a scope issue or it's a price point issue or it's both. And then you can assess from there. Okay, next time, maybe I'll offer five things instead of 200 things. And I will cap the hours at about 10 hours. And then maybe I'll stick with a 230, right? Or maybe I'll double my price and I'll still stick with that scope of work. But now you have learned from that experience and decided to adjust accordingly. And this is a lot of what we do in business ownership at first is we maybe don't know, we have to try it and find out, oh my goodness, that was 40 hours of work more than I had expected. I need to price it higher. And then you go and test it out and try it out with the next offer in the next pitch. And the good thing is that if you are pitching to new clients all the time, they don't know what your old pricing was. So you could go from <laughs> 250 to $2,300 for the same support, knowing that that's going to make you profitable because you've done the math and you know, your margins, meaning the what you charge versus your cost to produce or provide that service is still, you know, high enough for you to be in business for a long time. Absolutely. And you're also a corporate dropout. And a lot of our listeners are either considering dropping out of corporate, setting up their own business, or they have already set up their own business. Now, I tell you, my goal initially it was to not go out of business in the first year, in the second year to match my corporate salary. <laughs> and, you know, this is was my goal. Um, and I, I, I was very lucky that I could already match my salary in my first year. But with that said, is this a good goal to set or should we aim 50% or 150%? What's a good number to focus on in the first year of setting up our own business? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, everyone's journey is going to be different. So it depends on the hours you put, how much, you know, effort, how much background you have in maybe marketing and sales. Sometimes entrepreneurs forget that that's like the main thing that brings in the dollars. So even if you're doing something else that you're good at, you also got to get good at sales and marketing or you can hire that out either way. Um, but the first goal should be definitely to replace your corporate salary. I think if you were a highly paid professional, um, going out on your own, you should be able to make that or more. And what I tell people, the math, the way it works is whatever salary you think you want to pay yourself in the first year or the first couple of years, because, you know, it takes some time to get up to speed. You have to do that math, whatever that number is, times it by one and a half or two and a half that amount, because that is what it takes for you to actually walk away from your business every year with that salary you want. So if it's $100,000, you should be aiming to make between 150 and 250 a year in order for you to be compensated at that level because the business still has to pay the bills. It still needs to be able to hire the team that you need and support and software and tools. They're not free. You have to pay for them. And there's overhead um, items that you will need to cover cost-wise and again, by making your list of costs and kind of understanding what those might be ahead of time gives you a good idea of what your revenue target should be for the business in a given year for you to walk away with the salary that you need and the serve from the business that you created. And also, you know, growing a business to the first six figure is not easy. So there will be a lot of learning happening between now and when you get there. And after that, repeating and consistently staying in business is something that you actively have to work in, be disciplined at, and consistently take the actions to be able to see the results. It's not a once and done. Uh, I'm so glad that you mentioned that marketing and sales is literally 
or you do all the time as a business owner because people often expect just because they're the best at doing something everyone runs the door in and it hasn't happened ever and it will never happen and nowadays we've got so much more opportunities and choices in you know globally why would we go to this one person when we've got 20 or 100 other people who could do the same thing so it is constantly this reinforcing what can you do how do you do it for whom do you do it and it's being consistent in delivering that now when we talk about replacing the salary, absolutely agree with the 1.5 to 2 um, times the, the number because what we don't often realize is we don't have sick leave, we don't have holidays, we don't have superannuation or anything for our pension fund. So we have to actually pay for that ourselves. And probably that should also be the reminder to not feel bad about charging more because you're not an employee anymore that is taken care of. You have to take care of yourself. And I wish education, traditional education would teach mm -hmm. us that because that actually sets you up for success, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. And whatever you are making in corporate, don't forget that they were taking care of your health insurance. They were taking care of your retirement. They were taking care of maybe some stock that they were giving you. I mean, there was a lot of benefits outside of your take home pay that you mm -hmm. were you know paid for that whether or not you saw it or paid attention or looked at that it was happening in the background so you were taking care of it in other ways as well and now we have to duplicate that inside of our own businesses but guess what you're on the hook for all those costs so it's exactly right as I think a lot of business owners are just so focused on I'm just going to replace my income to start but there's so many other things you need to replace but let's just make it you know an attainable goal to just get started somewhere and then over time you'll build to that it is all in how you price it all is in in the margin calculation that I was speaking about. And it's because so some of those costs feel hitting or not um, clear that some business owners get in trouble because they are not able to save for retirement or they're not able to pay for their health insurance or they're not able to, you know, contribute to their kids' education like they used to because they didn't factor that into their prices and then are undercharging or whatever you got paid in corporate was what corporate dictated was your rate. That is not the rate out there. You should go <laughs> do some research, benchmark with other companies, see what they're doing, what their value they're providing, maybe tweak your marketing message to make sure the value is comprehended. And if not, hire someone that can help you do that. But at the end of the day, I think as business owners, we have to be very clear that half of our time or half of our job is really marketing and business development. Whether we like it, we don't like it, we're good at it or not. If sales are not coming in, you will not have a business for long. And if you're not comfortable with that, then you might want to reconsider whether or not business ownership is for you. Because honestly, it, it is what it takes in order to be successful until you're able to afford to outsource it or delegate it out. Mm -hmm, absolutely agree and you know often people romanticizing entrepreneurship because it is cool and startups are amazing and you've got the foosball tables and all those funny things but it is running <laughs> it is a lot of hard work and it's not for everyone and there's nothing bad about it but it's knowing what you actually get into it and also that numbers are a big part of what you're doing every day and sales and marketing and rejection and everything in between this is just what comes with running your own business um you also talked about benchmarking and researching to see what's out there can you give us a bit of a benchmark in terms of when we talk about margin what should we actually consider what is a healthy margin what is too much of a margin if there's such a thing um how do we start there yeah. So, you know, for service-based businesses or professional services providers, we actually have a really fantastic business model and from a financial perspective, because we don't have overhead of rent unless we choose to have it. We don't have like those fixed costs that a lot of retail-based businesses or physical location businesses have, and that eats into their margins. Same with like inventory-based businesses. So you have a framework, you have IP intelligence, things that you know how to do, expertise that you're going to put out there, and you get paid for that consulting, you know, aspect of it. But you don't really need a team. You don't need more than like a computer and probably a few software licenses, and you're good to go. So your margins actually tend to be on the higher end, which is not common for other types of businesses. So if you're benchmarking with other type of industries or other type of businesses, just know that when you tell them your numbers, they might think that is impossible. <laughs> and that's probably true for their type of business. But for consulting or professional services, you should be looking at a 50 to 70% margin. This is after you cover all your cost of running business, your registrations, your license, you know, uh, maybe saving some for taxes as well. 
And you should have a profit of between 40 and 50% in a given year, because again, your overhead are, your costs are low. You don't have a ton of overhead. And this is what you should be aiming to do. Now, you all don't start in that place. It's okay. We all you know, make progress towards that. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more like it just depends. And this ranges are, our ranges are intended to give you an idea of what's possible. And then make sure that you are not overloading your profit and loss statement with too many costs too early on, unless you project that you're scaling fast. And then you see the revenue that shows up for that scaling as well. Cause there is some you know, fast growing companies out there that will bring in the employees and the things that they need because they know they're getting the contracts, you know, six figure contracts and things that are just making it really hard without the people. So if you have that problem, fantastic. If you don't and you're slow growing, then you just want to aim to have those type of margins and profitability so that you are being compensated well, but you also have money to reinvest back into the growth of the company. Because sometimes we always say, well, we won't pay ourselves because we got to invest in the company. No, you should be able to do both. Pay yourself and also invest back in the business. And if I need to prioritize one, it's going to be paying my CEO or the owner of the business because I need them to stay in the game and keep working hard to produce that money for the business. Absolutely. Um, this is usually the last thing that we think of to also pay ourselves. But if we had to replace ourselves, somebody has to do the work. So we better, you know, pay ourselves well. And you said this magical word, which is kind of my love language frameworks, because in the end, if you want to be more profitable, you need to have a rinse and repeatable system that you don't have to constantly come up with something new and research and develop new worksheets and new whatever it might be, because in the end, this costs you money because it costs you time. Yes. Um, and so many, especially early on, they don't have that. So every new client is a new um, approach to solving the same problem. Um, so, you know, this is this is a big factor that people don't consider when they go into service-based business, but this is exactly the holy grail. I find how you can leverage your IP and be profitable. Yeah, and I think too often um, we're sold that, you know, dream, like you mentioned, like the startup that hits it big and sells for millions and millions of dollars. That, that is probably like the 1% of businesses that most of the businesses we work with are, are consistently growing year over year. They're self-funded bootstrap. Some might have investor money, some might not, but they are, they know how to sell. They know what they're selling. They're staying consistent in their framework. They're just maybe tweaking it to make it better, but it literally are boring businesses. What you would think is doing the same thing over and over again for many years and just refining it and doing it better every single time. And moving too fast from offer to offer, you know, offering new things every time people engage with you, it's going to lead to confusion where if you stay consistent with one good solid offer and then maybe branch out from there a few other offers. And then also not everything has to be shown to everyone, either you can have behind the scenes offers that you can then lead people through that make sense that are a good fit for them. But you need to know, how do we engage people? What are our margins on that offer? Are we priced correctly? And are we working with the right size of clients that can afford to pay us those prices? And we can solve a big enough problem to have enough value for what we're charging and keep it consistent. So people are not confused that every time they come work with Carla, they don't know what they're working on because she puts on, you know, every single different offer. They know they come to us for projections. They know to, they come to us for a solid financial plan so they can have clarity on their path. And they know that they come to us to handle their books, to make sure they're done professionally and they're completed on time. So they have the results they need to make decisions. When you have those solid offers, people are less confused. Therefore you get more yeses. Oh, so much yes to that. <laughs> because often even just being able to hand over your books, it makes such a difference because, you know, there's a saying, uh, risk doesn't discriminate against the size of a business. So people say just because I'm a solopreneur, um, the risk doesn't apply to me or governance or compliance doesn't uh, apply to me. But then we're getting hit with a big tax invoice or with a fine or whatever it might be. So protecting in your financial and also legal health of a business is certainly something that we should look into from day one. So I'm glad that you're working with business owners and doing exactly that, that they can focus on doing the marketing, doing the sales, what they are best at and what they have to do themselves. 
Yeah, bookkeeping is not optional. It's the foundation <laughs> of every financial decision you're going to make. So if those are not being done correctly, or you don't have the time to do them, because again, you're growing the business and that's what you're focused on, you should ask for that early on. It's pretty affordable and you're going to get better support by having a professional that does this day in and out, do it for you. Then you struggle your way through whatever program you're trying to learn that you probably hate. And you can have way more fun in your business by doing the things that you enjoy doing than that you're good at that only you can do rather than trying to figure things out that maybe are not as fun, but they're fun for us, but not for most people. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Like even just learning this new software or this new requirement or whatever it might be, that takes so much time out of the business that could be used to actually do the sales and the marketing and the simply delivery of the services and we're getting paid a lot more for that. Now, I'm curious, you are a fractional CFO. So businesses can work with you as their CFO, but not being on a full-time um, employment engagement. When or what is the kind of sign that we are ready as a business owner to hire somebody? And when is it better to engage somebody like yourself more as a contractor and um, somebody who can bring in specialized expertise without being on a payroll? Yeah, great question. And I always say like, you should consider the business needs before you go hire a full-time employee, because that is a big commitment. And most businesses maybe are not ready for that. And you can start small with a contractor hourly just to get some support and help that you need without the huge cost burden when you're not ready for it yet. And they can grow with you over time to ideally become a full-time employee or, you know, whatever role that you have available down the road because they grew with you. And so we engage with clients as a fractional CFO on a contract basis for our business owners that are maybe earlier on their journey. We do one-time projects to project out and give them the financial clarity to have a financial plan on how they're going to achieve those margins and profits that we talked about and also help them have an actionable list of steps to take to achieve those. So it's not just putting numbers up on the screen. Anyone can do that, but, uh, or guessing whatever it might be, it's actually tying that to ex things that they can execute and do in order to achieve those goals. So that's really key. And also being a partner in removing problems and issues as they're trying to achieve those goals. That's a big one that we help clients manage. Also managing their team. Sometimes, you know, they've never managed a bookkeeper or an accountant and they have no idea what they're talking about, what they're doing, how to manage them, what to tell them what to do. And they're really relying on an expert to come in and lead that function on their behalf. And so whoever you're hiring for your bookkeeping or accounting or CFO roles should come in and start leading that function and driving the right conversations around what are the needs of the company in those areas. That's why bringing in a fractional CFO at the right time can really make a huge difference in the business, not only the financial results, but also on the growth and the speed as to where you're growing. To answer your question around at what point do you bring a fractional CFO? First, you got to have your foundation and your house in order. You got to have the bookkeeping. You got to have the accountant in place. So those are the And to answer your question about when is a good time to bring a CFO on board is you want to have your bookkeeping and taxes uh, handled and accounted for and working well for you. You maybe have a few employees or contractors that are working in your team. You know that you're growing fast and you need someone to come in and lead that function and give you clear goals if you don't already have them financially and also how to achieve them. And you've been in business two, three years. You know what you're selling, who you're selling it to, and what problems you're solving. It's a good time to engage a CFO to come in and build a financial plan for the company, but also help you stay accountable to it. And then make sure that you have the right pricing, that you have the right margins, that you make those profits reality so that you can have cash in the bank to reinvest back in the business as well as in growing the company with whatever other positions you want to hire. And then you're clear. You're on those timelines. So when the all that needs to happen and how it all works together. 
<laughs> well, that sounds a lot more achievable and easier than trying to figure out everything yourself. And you mentioned one very important thing. It's driving the right kind of conversation because if you don't know what questions you ask, you will never look for those answers. So you will never get exposed to different ways of thinking. And, you know, one of the elements that you also focus on is wealth building and wealth building is very different to revenue generating. It's part of it, but it could also be a different aspect. I'm really curious, often personal branded business gets not stuck, but focus too much on building revenue with their expertise um, and on their reputation, but they're not thinking about how can I reinvest? How would you start with wealth building strategies that go beyond our expertise, how we can monetize ourselves? Yeah. So it all starts by having those profitable business and margins that are healthy in order for you to be able to take money out of the business and move it to your personal wealth building. And we always want to talk about strategies that are building outside of the business you have as well as growing the business that you have at the same time. And why that's important is because maybe one day you'll sell the business. That's great. But I don't always rely on that happening for all of our business owners or, you know, if something happens and they have to close the business or it never gets passed down or they never actually sell because that happens, they should have something to fall back on. So either they bought a building to maybe do the business they're in, like the office space, instead of renting, they decided to buy the building and lease it out to not just themselves, but also other business owners. That could be a wealth building strategy. Maybe you take the money out and you buy rental properties. Maybe you take the money out and invest in index funds. So it's anything you can do outside of the business, but the business is funding it through the business profits. And so we say it's wealth building power by the business profits because you're taking from the profits to fund your retirement, to fund your kids' college education, to fund a second property or a real estate portfolio or something else that's outside, maybe even a second business. I see a lot of people doing this too, where we've given them so much profit. They're not sure what to do with it, but they have a passion for something else they've been wanting to do their whole life. And they're like, okay, I got this consulting thing down. The professional services are working great. And now I want to open a bakery or something. And so they use that money to, as the seed funding or venture capitalists, essentially, to open their second business. And so it could be so many different things. It could just be saving your, you know, building your savings in your bank account for your personal side, as well as maybe for the business side. It's thinking beyond the business. What does the business do for you besides pay you a salary? What is it allowing you to do so that you can build wealth? So one day when you look back, you're not saying, oh my goodness, I can't sell this business because that's all I have. I have this other assets I generated through the business profits that allow me to now retire. Or then if I sell it, that's just gravy on top, but I'm not 100% reliable on this business selling in order to retire. Ah, oh, so good. Because in the end, it all starts with making profit, which means we need to have a good margin on top of our services because it is the foundation to then do anything beyond that. And it's not just uh, trying to get rich quick because it's it's usually not a thing. <laughs> um, yes, get maybe, rich slow is, is better. <laughs> yes, it is better. <laughs> and maybe to wrap things up, because you also mentioned about um, there's probably 1% of businesses that actually get sold. If we were to try and build something that would be able to be sold, what is the big difference? Like what kind of assets would we need to look for? What what should we focus on building versus having more so a lifestyle business that, that pays our bills? Yeah, you should strive to be CEO optional. And what that means is that your business can run without you being there, that the business does not need you in order to make money that is making money regardless if you're there or not. Now, you can choose to be there. That's fine. It's just that you build the frameworks, the system, the team, the processes, and you're servicing clients without you having to do the work. And a lot of that comes with building maybe an agency model where you have other people doing what you do, the framework that you develop, and the way that you do it to get clients results without it being you the one delivering it. Or it could be a passive income play where you have some kind of digital course or some you know, other offer that doesn't rely on you showing up in order for it to make money. And so that's the bigger, you know, longer term plan is to figure out how, what is our exit strategy. And besides selling, it can be all these other things in addition to, because now you're building what we call a company instead of a job. So we start by all trying to just replace our income. That's the job. We built the job. Now we work in it. But if we don't work, we don't make money. So if you're sick, you stop billing. That's a problem. And then you want to move on to the next stage, which is you build a company that runs itself. Now you happen to be around. You're still doing some work. That's fantastic. But you're not required in order for it to be successful and continue to grow. Um, 
you know, obviously you got to delegate a lot of things, systems, marketing, you know, got to bring in some people to help you be able to support all that. But it is something, um, it is part of our framework and journey we take our clients through to make sure that they are CEO optional down the road. So if they do want to sell one day, there's a valuation to their company that is not tied to them sticking around in order to get that big payout. Oh, love it. That was so much good and valuable information and insights. And I think this is something we all need to become more literate in how to run a business like a CEO, also when we're just a business of one. But in the end, does it sustain not only you, but also the generations beyond? Or can it finance another venture or hobbies or whatever it might be? So Carla, thank you so much for all your wisdom, for all your expertise. Where's the best way to find you, uh, engage with you? And what kind of support, especially for small business owners, are you providing? Yeah, they can find us on our website at wealthworthwithin.com. You can book a call if you're ready to hire us uh, for some support uh, through our contact us page. You can follow us on our newsletter if you just want to hear more about what offers we're putting out there, which we're working on some new ones. So uh, make sure you sign up for the newsletter um, for once a month. And if not, watch us on social media. We put out a lot of free content for business finances on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram to educate business owners and close that knowledge gap that a lot of you maybe have because you didn't go into business to manage finances. You went to business because you love what you do. <laughs> we want to keep you in business so you can do more of that. And then if you're just trying to engage with us for a one-time you know, support, we can uh, support you that way with uh, financial projections and having a financial plan. This time of year is really important. So you know, what are you trying to achieve before you get started with your year? And then before you know it, you turn around and you haven't achieved many of the goals that you thought you wanted to because it wasn't clear and you didn't know what to do with that. So we can build a plan in place or just check in halfway through the year. Like, where are you at? Have you made progress? What is left of the year? Can we pivot and change the direction if needed? And that's our mid-year review as well as our annual budget planning options to work with us. So good. I love everything about it. So again, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your wisdom. And we'll put all the links in the show notes uh, that people can check you out and educate themselves further. So finance and the whole financial side of a business is not as daunting and overwhelming as it may seem to many. Thank you so much again. Thanks for having me.